Thank you. Uh, and I, I very much like to thank the uh, organizers uh, for inviting me. It's always lovely to be here, uh, particularly so in this uh, occasion where we're honoring Rod's work. Um, so I, I was Rod's postdoc, of course, and when uh, when I was in Wellington then for years after we did a bunch of work on algorithmic randomness, but before I got to Wellington, Rod and I uh, spent some time in uh, Madison visiting uh, Stefan Lemp and Reed Solomon, and there we worked on reverse math. Uh, one of the things that we did there <coughs> was build this uh, <coughs> Example of a computable instance of stable Ramsey's theorem for pairs with no low solutions. Um, now, as, as many of you know, recently there's this beautiful paper uh, of Chang, Slayman, and Yang where they separated uh, stable Ramsey's theorem for pairs from Ramsey's theorem for pairs. And what they did in that paper was for, for any computable instance of SRT22, they provided a low solution. Now, of course, the way that you reconcile these two things is that they were working over a non-standard uh, model, non-standard first-order model. And I found it interesting when, when I heard of their results that uh, back when we did our work, it certainly didn't occur to me at all to even ask whether, you know, you could, you could provide low solutions if you're working in, in a model with less than full induction, even though our proof was... <laughs> Uh, an injury construction on a tree, and that's the kind of thing that usually takes you know, some amount of induction. But of course, it wasn't really on my map, right? I was coming from the computability theory background. I wasn't really thinking of non-standard models. Since then, uh, <coughs> I've learned to appreciate them and to find them quite interesting, even, even still from the computability theory uh, perspective. Um, and so today, I wanted to talk about sorry, well, some <laughs> reverse math that comes from looking at some very basic model theory that leads to some first order puzzles. I, you know, I think of them as puzzles because I'm not sure that they're really important uh, questions. Uh, Kata's talk yesterday talked about the serious part of first order principles. This is maybe more like fun puzzles, I don't know, but I'd still like to know the answer. Um, oh, this, yeah, so this here, of course, is, is Hercules and, and the Hydra, or, or Rod, you know, struggling with a problem, but, <coughs> but it's actually Hercules and the Hydra. <coughs> and the reason, the reason I, I chose that, because the, the Hydra, well, of course, <coughs> There's a very famous hydra associated with models of arithmetic, which is the Kirby Paris hydra. But more generally, I think of the hydra as, as a representation of this idea of the non standard finite, right? There's only finitely many heads, but it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to cut all of them if you cut the first one and then the second one and then the third one and so forth. So anyway, I think of the hydra as, as representing that. Well, because it regenerates heads as you cut. So. Uh, okay, so. <coughs> RCA naught, of course, is the <coughs> usual weak base theory of reverse mathematics. And you can essentially think of it as computable mathematics. You'll be very close, except that you limit the induction that's available to sigma 0, 1 formulas. And in general, I sigma 0 and induction is induction limited to sigma 0, 1 formulas. Um, and by the way, <coughs> I, I'll have a lot of things where I say this implies that and whatever. And if I don't qualify it otherwise, I just always mean over RCA naught. Um, so, of course, I sigma and our landmark um, first order principles by which one can <laughs> calibrate other things and live at that level. Um, other <laughs> important family of principles is, is the bounding principles, B sigma n. So, sigma n bounding just means that if you have a sigma n formula phi, <laughs> and there's an implicit quantification over the n for all n. Uh, if for every i less than n, there is an x such that phi i x holds, then there's a bound, a common bound, <laughs> such that you can find these witnesses x below the bound. <coughs> of course, classically true, but this is a, a first order principle. And the way these work is that <coughs> b sigma n is strictly between i sigma n minus one and i sigma n. Uh, and in fact, uh, Slayman showed that b sigma n is equivalent to i delta n. Uh, to I delta n, so that makes sense. And of course, I, I pi n is the same as I sigma n, and, and so on. So these are, these are uh, form a, a nice hierarchy that we can think about for first order principles. Now, I, except for one slide, I'm going to be working entirely in the portion of the universe up to I sigma 2. So you've got I sigma 1, which is present in R say naught, then you have B sigma 2, and then you have I sigma 2. And of course, even B sigma 2 is not proven in R say naught. So let me say just a little bit about uh, uh, 
background for theories and, and structures. So when I write T, I'll just always mean a countable, complete, consistent theory. When I say it, I'll just say theory, but always assume I'm, it's countable and complete and consistent. And all structures that I mention will be countable. So some things that I might say something that sounds false if you're thinking of uncountable structure, but just stick the word countable in front of everything. Uh, by a tree here, I just mean a binary tree. <laughs> Subset of uh, set of finite binary strings closed under initial segments. So that's what I always mean by a tree. Now, in this work in, in, in reverse math, we want to identify M not with its atomic diagram, but with its full elementary diagram, because that's what makes sense for looking at the relationship between uh, theories and models, because otherwise everything ends up being at the level of ASA, not just because you need to construct the theory. So in terms of computability theory, we're not looking at computable models, we're looking at decidable models. So where a model is decidable, if its elementary diagram is computable. For a theory, decidable means the same as computable, but for a model, that's what I mean, full elementary diagram. Now, in RCA not, you can prove that every theory of a complete theory <coughs> has a model. <coughs> you can effectivize uh, the completeness theorem there. But what if you're interested in models with certain special properties? In particular, I want to think about properties that ensure that the model is completely determined by its type spectrum. If you say the model has this type spectrum plus this extra condition <coughs> of what kind of model it is, then there's only one. And, and one reason that I'm interested in this is that this means that the, the, the procedure of constructing this model that becomes quite combinatorial, right? There's a single structure that we're building, as we'll see, we end up in the realm of these combinatorial principles that I'm interested in living in the world below Ramsey's theorem for pairs and so forth. Okay, so let me begin to talk about atomic models. Um, so, <coughs> an atomic model, of course, one where all the types realized are, are, are principal. So, <coughs> The only things that are there are the things that need to be there, like an algebraically closed field without transcendentals, right? just what the theory forces there to be there. And of course, atomic models are all isomorphic. There's only, classically, there's only one countable atomic model. <laughs> if you want to think of this, this uh, reverse mathematically, that lives at the level of ACA not to prove that, but classically it's true. Uh, now, when are there atomic models? Well, so an atom of a theory is just a formula containing exactly one type. So it's a formula that isolates the type. It implies everything in the type. <coughs> and T is atomic if every formula consistent with T is implied by an atom. Or equivalently, you can say it's contained in a principal type of T, but I want to state it that way. You'll see why in, in a second. Uh, so just think, but that may be the easiest way to think of it, is that, the, that every formula there's a way to extend it to a type that's principal or isolated. <coughs> now, the condition of being atomic for a theory is exactly what you need to get atomic models. Now, on one direction, if T has an atomic model, then it is atomic. That's easy to prove in our say dot. But what I'm calling the atomic model theorem is the other direction. If T is atomic, then it has an atomic model. So then the problem there is this question of, OK, I give you an atomic theory. <coughs> You've got the theory. <coughs> you know there is an atomic model. <coughs> There really is only one up to class class morphism. Build it. And how difficult is that? <coughs> OK, so let me, let me first uh, say so one of the things that I, that I find interesting in the atomic model theorem is it gives a nice case study on how one can kind of strip away the, the <coughs> mathematical specifics of, of a theorem to re reveal a sort of combinatorial core, which is something that I like to think of, of reverse math and computer mathematics as doing. So the first step here when you're thinking of the atomic model theorem that way is to get rid of the models. Um, and you can do that using <coughs> this theorem of Gontrab and Ertazin and independently Harrington <coughs> that says that an atomic theory has a decidable atomic model if and only if there's a computable listing of the principal types of T. <coughs> of course, you can relativize that. It just means from one you can get the other. So <coughs> you can say that the so instead of producing an atomic model, I can just produce a listing of the principal types and then just rely on this theorem to say, oh, therefore, I can produce the atomic model effectively. So that's good. I can forget about producing a model. I can just produce a list of types, which starts looking much more like a combinatorial object. This theorem is actually true in RCA not as well, uh, that you have an atomic model if only if you have a listing of principal types. Now, often when you go from a computability theoretic theorem to showing that it's true in RCA not, it's just a matter of like looking at the proof and saying, oh, it works, right? 
in this case, actually, in this work with, with Shore and Simon, we had to do a little bit more work because the proof of the Gottschalk, Nittas, and Harrington theorem in the direction of getting the model from the types, of course, the other direction is trivial, but the direction of getting the model from the types <coughs> is a priority argument. And priority arguments sometimes need more induction. Than, so to get this to work, you actually have to use this technique of shore blocking, which was developed for high recursion theory, <laughs> but works very well here. So here is a situation where you might have first order problems, but you don't. So it actually works out. OK, so once you have that, you know that even in the sense of reverse math, forget about the models. We're just building listings of types. Having gotten rid of the model, let's get, her, let's get rid of the model theory. Uh, so for, okay, so at this point, we can restate, restate the atomic model theorem as just, if T is atomic, then there's a listing of the principal types. But now, <coughs> types of a theory naturally live in trees. That's often the way people think about it. You can look at a tree, tree of types <coughs> of a model. Uh, and then the paths on this, on this tree correspond to the types. And of course, isolated paths, right? So if you have Isolated paths just being, you know, you have a tree and whatever, then you have this path that from some point on it's the unique path. Here, <coughs> corresponds to principal types. Now, of course, these trees are kind of special trees and not general trees. They are trees uh, that have no dead ends, right? Because if a formula, you know, if something is consistent, then you can keep extending it one way or the other. So, uh, <coughs> now, if you're looking at atomic theories, the resulting tree is going to have its principal types dense, right? Because remember, atomic means that any formula can be extended to a principal type. So the corresponding tree will have its isolated paths dense. Above any node, there's an isolated path. You can also go the other way. If I give you a tree with node that ends, you can build a theory whose types correspond exactly to the paths of the tree. It's not hard. Just think of like a language with infinitely many unary predicates. And this says u0, not u0, u1, not u1. And you can kind of build it that way. So by considering trees of types and coding trees in the theories in the other direction, <coughs> You can restate AMT with removing entirely the model theory and just seeing how it really is a combinatorial principle. <coughs> if V is a tree with isolated paths dense, then there's a listing of the isolated paths of T. Well, that's sort of true. <coughs> because I haven't been completely precise about what I mean here, and we'll see in a second why I say sort of true. But essentially, that's correct. If I was just doing computability theory, I would say this is correct, correct. But over I say not, we'll see. Yep. Oh, sorry, isolated paths dense means every point is, is extended by an isolated path, therefore it can't be a dead end. So yeah, I just, that's, just, that's just saving ink, as it were. <laughs> saving slide space. But yeah, thanks, yeah, that's, that's, that's. <clears throat> okay, so that's, so now once we've done this, we have this idea of this combinatorial content, <laughs> we can start looking for the computability theoretic content and the reverse mathematical content, right? Uh, and it becomes a little easier thinking of it this way because you don't have to worry about the actual construction of models and blah, blah. You can just think of, okay, I've got trees. I want to list paths. That's a very, that's the kind of procedure that we can imagine one can analyze computability theoretically. And in fact, so Barbara Chivin in her dissertation showed, for example, that if you have a decidable atomic theory, then it has a low decidable atomic model. Or if you want, if you have a computable tree of this kind, then you can find a low listing of, of the paths. Now, whenever you have these kind of results about ex the existence of a low something, the first thing people think is, oh, it comes somehow from the low basis theorem of, of Jakish and Sohr. Here it doesn't. Uh, so in joint work with Chima, Knight, and Sohr, we showed, um, so <coughs> fix, for example, fix a delta 2x, <coughs> x computable in, in zero prime. Then saying that every decidable atomic theory has an x decidable atomic model is the same as saying that x is non-low too. So in particular, if you take something like a low PA degree, right, a low PA degree, of course, can, you know, can find paths to trees, and so it's a, it's a realization of, you know, weak clinics level. You can build an entire model of weak clinics level below there. But here it's saying that, no, this is not going to be able to find models of every decidable atomic theory, atomic models. So this is a different kind of situation. In fact, this is a more general fact. The actual, the actual connection, the, the real connection with computability theory, <coughs> here was worked out also in this paper by Chris Kanaitis, is that saying that every decidable atomic theory has an ex-decidable atomic model is the same as saying 
that no delta 2 function dominates every x computable function. Or the other way of saying is that x can compute escape functions. If you give it a delta 2 function, it can always compute a function that infinitely often is bigger than it. And that's a very natural computability theoretic property. Comes up in a lot of guises. <laughs> so we see that this theorem of model theory, <coughs> which also has something to do with, um, with trees, also has a very natural computability theoretic guise. And this is you know, exactly what's happening computability theoretically. And from this theorem, the previous one follows because the, the you know, non low tuness for delta 2 sets corresponds exactly to that. So one thing that we see here is that. The level, so when we're looking at, at reverse math, we're looking at reverse math that's happening outside of the level of the you know, usual big five. One thing that's interesting is to look at levels that come up and, and try to see <coughs> whether we can have levels that have, well, there's two properties that one might, I think, desire of a sort of level of the, um, of the reverse mathematical hierarchy that'd be very nice. One of them is sort of for it to be somehow populated or diverse, right? That there's, it's not just a single principle, but there's several things. In there, and the other one, which is something that uh, Antonio Montalban isolated as a, as a desirable quantity at some point, is this idea of robustness, that you make small variations in your principles, and that shouldn't change the level. And of course, that's what happens with the big five levels and so on. <coughs> in the case of AMT, as we're starting to see, <coughs> there's at least a certain amount of populatedness, right? You have AMT, you have theorem about trees, you have this kind of computability theoretic property, and so forth. Robustness, as we'll see. <coughs> Depends on whether you care about first order. If you're working over, say, I sigma 2, I think it's pretty robust. And we'll see. If you're not, if you're really working over R say not, then it's kind of brittle. Anyway, uh, one corollary, of course, of all of this is, as I said, is that WKO not does not imply MT because <coughs> you can take a low PA degree and have an entire model of WKO not below it. And of course, the theorem here is saying that it's not going to be a model of the atomic model theorem. OK, so the atomic model theorem is not computably true. In fact, it's not even provable in Reconnexum. So what else can we say about the reverse mathematical content of AMT? <coughs> so ADS is, is, is uh, the, the I think very natural principle saying <coughs> that every infinite linear order has an infinite ascending or descending sequence. Uh, now, like Ramsey's theorem, you can separate ADS into a stable and a cohesive version. And the stable version is uh, obtained by defining a linear order to be stable <coughs> if every element has either finitely many predecessors or finitely many successors, which means classically that it looks like, well, I guess omega plus n or n plus omega star or omega plus omega star, which is the interesting situation because the other ones are obvious. But the interesting situation is when it looks like omega plus omega star, right? So it just looks like an ascending sequence followed by a descending sequence. And then the principle says that there is an infinite ascending sequence or infinite descending sequence here. And if you look at the natural color, there's a very easy coloring uh, which makes RT22 imply ADS, which is just a coloring where you color two things red if their order coloring is the same as their natural number coloring and blue otherwise. If you look at what it means for that coloring to be stable, it exactly means that the ordering is going to be stable. Uh, so RT22 implies ADS. And ADS in turn implies SADS, and they're getting weaker and weaker. SRT22, of course, also implies SADS. Um, so, you know, we're talking about a fairly weak principle, but um, AMT is even below that. So, not proven that we can not, so not completely weak, <coughs> but provable uh, from SADS. Now, if you, th if you think of AMT, particularly in this combinatorial guise of, of trees, however you're thinking of it, um, these facts that I've mentioned before are not actually that, that kind of mysterious. They, they make sense that so you still need to prove them. But if you look at the, at the previous slide, right? so let me just go back for a sec. If you look at this equivalence here, uh, uh, let's see, uh, oh, whatever. If you look at the equivalence here to, having, to, to computing escape functions, um, well, what do you need to do if I'm trying to list isolated paths in a tree, right? I'm over here. You know, so for each node, I can try to just find an isolated path above it. And how do I do that? Well, I can go, oh, OK, maybe this looks like an isolated path, but maybe it's not, and maybe I can make another decision and so forth. The problem, of course, if I was doing this computably is, is I would always make the wrong decision, right? But there's a delta 2 function, certainly, that tells you where the right decisions are. Because <coughs> being an isolated path is, well, in fact, a pi 0, 1 property, right, being an isolated node. So you can imagine that if you write the function just right, <coughs> and you have an escaping function, if you follow that escaping function, it will tell you 
well, maybe you'll make a few mistakes, but at some point it will actually give you the right answer. Now, as soon as you're in an isolated path, you can't leave it, right? So now, great. So it makes sense that an escaping function is exactly what you need here. And then if you move over to looking at SADS, you say, why is this, what's the connection between linear orderings and, and atomic models? Well, <coughs> as you're building a computable <coughs> ordering of this, thing, of this sort, one thing you can do is you can create large gaps. Right? You can say, well, for a long time, I'm going to put points on this side. And then for a long time, I'm going to put points on this side and so forth. You can create some large gaps. And you can do it in such a way <coughs> that these large gaps encode an escaping function. Now, more or less, right? You have to have some kind of table. <laughs> now, if you have an infinite ascending sequence, it, leaves in, it lives entirely in here. An infinite descending sequence it lives entirely in here. So these sequences would have to have these gaps in there and therefore be able to encode an escaping function. So all of this kind of makes sense if you think of it uh, in terms of this combinatorics. And then, obviously, we have to prove that it's even weaker and so forth. But now, and, and one way to do that is via conservativity. <laughs> So now we get to some of the, the first order stuff. So again, in this joint work with Short and Simon, we show that AMT is, well, it's actually a little bit more than pi 1 in some case, but let me restrict to that. So pi 1 conservative. So what I mean here, forget, again, forget about the pi 1s so if we're thinking of first order principle. Just think of conservative for first order principles. <coughs> if you have a first order principle <coughs> and you can prove it from RCA0 plus AMT, then you can already prove it from RCA0. So that's what I mean by conservative over I sigma 1, so really over RCA0. But if you add B sigma 2, if you can prove it from RC naught plus AMT plus B sigma 2, you could already do it from RC naught plus B sigma 2, the same thing for I sigma 2. So it's really conservative over everything. So it's it really not giving you any new first order information. Okay. Now, one more thing that I want to talk about before getting some of these open questions is about the connection between AMT and genericity notions. So as I mentioned before, being an atom of a decidable theory or being a node here that isolates a path, right? So that above it there's a single path. That's a pi zero one property, <coughs> right? All you have to say here is there are no splits above this node, right? So that's a for all. It's a pi zero one property. So <coughs> a natural thing to look at is a concept of pi zero one genericity in relation to this. So there's this principle of pi zero one g, and what it says is if you have uniformly pi zero one dense predicates, d zero d one. I call them dense predicates because don't think. In reverse mathematical terms, don't think that I'm stating that D0, D1 exist as sets. They don't. They're given by formulas, right? Pi 0 and formulas. So uniformly pi 0 and dense predicates D0, D1, et cetera, <coughs> on the full binary tree, then there's a generic G that meets each one of them. So that's just the existence of a generic for these pi 0, 1 conditions. And as you might imagine, because finding isolated paths is a pi 0, 1 property, this should be enough power to find these paths. And in fact, pi 0, 1 g does imply AMT. But then you might think, well, but I have a lot of room in building these, these, these um, trees or theories or whatever I'm thinking of. Maybe this should be a general procedure. Maybe I should be able to encode any pi 0, 1 uh, predicate somehow as, you know, as isolated paths in the tree. So maybe I can go the other way around. And in fact, <coughs> Almost. So AMT actually implies pi 0, 1 g as well. They're actually equivalent. So this is another example of something that lives at the level of AMT. Computability, theoretically, that's just straight up true. And that was proved by Kinitis. It's certainly, uh, it's probably even a wire arc reduction, if you care about that. But it's certainly a computable reduction. He proved that. And if you just look at his proof, it works perfectly fine over I sigma 2. Uh, it's actually. <coughs> I'm kind of glossing it over saying, oh, you think that the, and it works, but it, it actually quite a bit of work. It was actually quite surprising that it, it works. You actually need a fairly complicated construction to code I sigma 2 into pi 0, 1g, but it works. But it does seem to need I sigma 2. And in fact, we can prove that it needs something. Because remember that AMT was pi 1 conservative, conservative over I sigma 2, B sigma 2, I sigma 1, B sigma 2, and I sigma 2. Pi 0, 1g is still conservative over I sigma 1 and I sigma 2, but not over B sigma 2. And in fact, it implies I sigma 2 over B sigma 2. So if you give me B sigma 2 and AMT, I don't get anything new. If you give me B sigma 2 and pi 0 and G, then I get I sigma 2, which is an interesting situation. And by the way, every time I go back and look at this thing, for a second I panic and go, there's something horribly wrong here. 
<coughs> how can you be conservative of I sigma 1 and yet imply I sigma 2 or B sigma 2? What about the statement that B sigma 2 implies I sigma 2? That's not a single statement. <coughs> These are schemes and they have parameters and so forth. So there's not a single statement that says B sigma 2 implies I sigma 2. For each instance of I sigma 2 that you want to imply, you have to use a different instance of B sigma 2. So there's nothing actually, nothing wrong here. It actually works. It's just a weird situation. So that's, I, I think, equal, that so <laughs> AMT and Pi 0, 1, G are almost the same, right? But there is this, this kind of unusual level of uh, force order difference. OK, so let me get to these puzzles, these, these questions, these things that show that you know, the hydra can be slippery. Uh, <coughs> we were interested in, in this paper with, uh, with Richard and, and, well, no, more recent paper with Richard and uh, Karen Lang, we were interested in <coughs> somehow understanding the difference between AMT and Pi 0 and G a little bit better for reasons that <coughs> will become clear later. Um, so the, this here's an attempt to capture the difference between AMT and, and, and Pi 0 and G, and it's what we call Pi 0 and GA. So GA for generic approximation. And the idea is this, instead of stating that a generic exists, let's state that we can approximate a generic. So if you have these uniformly pi zero one dense predicates, <coughs> then what the principle says is that there is an approximation, G0, G1, et cetera, such that in the limit, they become a generic. So for every one of our dense predicates, <coughs> there's some sigma such that from some point on, the Gs extend that sigma. So they, they dance around, they dance around, they go here, here, and eventually they settle on something in, in D0, and then eventually they settle on something in D1. Though of course, not necessarily in order, right? They might settle on the one in D1 before the one in D0, and so forth. So that's the Pi 0 and generic approximation. Now, <coughs> if you're thinking computability theoretically over the, the standard natural number, this is just true, <coughs> computably true. <coughs> because, well, you have Pi 0 1, uniformly Pi 0 1 predicates, right? Certainly in a delta 2 way, you can meet all of them. <coughs> And therefore, you can computably approximate it by the limit lemma, right? That doesn't quite work, right, when you have, when you have hydras around, right, when, you, when you're in the first, in, in a, in a non-standard situation. And in fact, um, pi 0 on GA is provable from I sigma 2. But if you don't have I sigma 2, uh, if, you, if you have B sigma 2, then in fact, you get I sigma 2. So <coughs> it's provable from I sigma 2, and it's equivalent to it over B sigma 2. So just like pi 0 on G, if you add it to B sigma 2 over R sigma 9, if you add it to B sigma 2, you get I sigma 2. The difference with pi 0 and G is that this one is now provable for I sigma 2. So somehow it, it looks like it's really the difference between AMT and pi 0 and G. Now notice that the difference between, <coughs> the difference between AMT and pi 0 and G is not going to be capturable by a first order principle, but because of the, because of the, um, because of the conservativity of pi 0 and G. <coughs> over uh, RCA naught. So this is a second order principle, but it's a second order principle that lives, it's kind of morally first order, right? It lives at that level of first order principle. So that's a possibility. <coughs> that's all nice, but <coughs> we don't actually know that whether AMT plus pi zero and GA actually implies pi zero and GA. Of course, pi zero and G implies it, right? That's obvious. But <coughs> we don't know whether, whether it really is that, right? Whether it really is the difference between AMT and pi zero and GA. And I'd, I'd like to know that. But that's the, the first puzzle that I'd really like to know. Okay, so, so that's one. And by the way, before I get to the other ones, let me, let me mention that you can extend this over. So this is my one slide that goes beyond I sigma 2. You can define pi 0 and G in the obvious way. You have pi 0 and dense predicates. And now you can define pi 0 and, G, and GA. And the approximation now is in the sense of the generalized limit level, where you have the limit of the limit of the limit of the limit, right? <laughs> So you're saying that you have this approximation with you know, however many indices, where for almost every S0, for almost every S1, for almost every S1, you actually have this extension in the sigma. So this is exactly what you'd get if you, if you look at approximation in the sense of, of the generalized Schoenfield limit lemma. And then you get exactly the same situation. Pi 0 NJ is provable for my sigma n, and it's equivalent to I sigma n over B sigma n. So, that actually extends all the way up. The proof here is actually more complicated than in the, in the um, sigma 1 case. Uh, with the one in the sigma 1 case is, is, is pretty much, the pi 1 case, sorry, is pretty much the same as 
for Pi 0, 1G, and here you need to do some other stuff. But, but it's true. And so you have this whole hierarchy. I don't know what they're good for, but you have this whole hierarchy of principles that are sort of uh, um, join up B sigma and Tai sigma. But now let me get back to trees. So remember that I said that the atomic model theorem can be restated as if V is a tree with isolated paths dense, then there's a listing of the isolated paths of, D's, of V. Let's be a little bit more precise about that. So remember that an atom of a theory was just a formula <coughs> that isolates a type. An atom of a tree is a, for, is, is a node that isolates a path. So an atom of a tree is a node contained exactly one infinite path. So you go over here, so it's a node like, say, this one, right? There's only one, one infinite path above it. So that's an atom. And then we can talk about what an atomic tree is. <laughs> an atomic tree is one where every node can be extended to an atom, or it's the same as saying that every node can be extended to an infinite path. OK. Great. So we seem to be in the same kind of situation. But now I'm going to make this other strange definition. I'm going to say that V is strongly atomic if whenever you give me finitely many nodes, then I can find, so you give me finally many nodes, like this one, this one, this one, this one, I can find corresponding atoms extending all of them, right? So one extending this one, one extending this one, and so on and so forth. Again, in the standard universe, this is a silly definition to make. Atomic obviously implies strongly atomic, right? You can do one, you can do seven. But if n is non-standard, then that's not as obvious. Sometimes, in some circumstances, you can get away with going from the single to the, the finite. And in fact, that's what happens for theories. The idea, why didn't I define strongly atomic theory? Well, because I don't need to. If you have an atomic theory and you give me finitely many formulas consistent with T, <coughs> take the conjunction of all of them. Just change the variables to make sure that the variables of all of them are disjoint. Take the conjunction. <coughs> That's a single formula. If I can find an atom extending that one, from that one I can produce atoms extending all the other ones by existentially quantifying out the other variables. So in the, sem in the situation of theories, there's no difference between atomic and strongly atomic because <coughs> finite, finite collections of formulas are single formulas. Trees, that's not true. There's no single node that corresponds to these n many nodes. And therefore, the statement that every atomic tree is strongly atomic actually requires B sigma 2. It actually turns out to be equivalent to B sigma 2. Uh, it's pretty easy to see that it, it's implied by B sigma 2 if you know how B sigma 2 works, but we showed in this work with, with Lang and Shore, we showed that it's actually equivalent to it. So now you say, okay, so now which one, you know, what's the version that actually corresponds to the atomic model theorem? And here is the actual precise one. It's the one that says that if a tree is strongly atomic, then there's a listing of the isolated paths of V. That's the one that actually we can prove <coughs> is equivalent to AMT. <coughs> Having done that, there's a natural thing to do, which is to give the other one a name, the atomic tree theorem. The atomic tree theorem says that if V is just atomic, then there's a listing of the isolated paths of V. So now we have a weaker hypothesis, stronger theorem. Except is it really stronger? Well, pi zero one G implies ATT in the same way that implies AMT. That's not difficult. <coughs> And ATT, of course, implies AMT because it's just a stronger statement. But we don't know whether AMT implies ATT. Maybe they're actually the same. Or maybe if you add pi 0, 1, GA, they're the same. And we don't know that. So that's another one of those puzzles that I'd like to know. It's got something fidget. It, 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 if AMT implies ATT, <coughs> then there's probably just some <coughs> clever proof that needs to go there. Uh, but if it doesn't, as I expect that it doesn't, then it might require some really fidgety building of a model, because if the model satisfies B sigma 2, they're the same. So it would have to be a model that doesn't satisfy B sigma 2, so it's got to look somewhat weird. Um, so it might be interesting from that point of view, from the technical point of view. OK, having done, having done all this fidgety work, let's get even fidgetier. <coughs> pi 0, 1 GA is a miniaturization of pi 0, 1 G, right? So this idea of bringing pi 0, 1 G down to the level of below I sigma 2. Here's a way to miniaturize ATT. So in, instead of saying that if you're atomic, then you can list all the paths, just say this. <coughs> if V is an atomic tree, <coughs> and you give me finitely many elements, then I can find a sequence of isolated paths uh, uh, extending all of them. Right? So you just give me finitely many, and I, I can find isolated. So that's a kind of finite version. If I could do that for every sigma at once, then I've got a listing of isolated paths, so I'm just doing finitely many of them. So we call that the finite ATT.
That's really weak. And yet, it's implied by B sigma 2. It's obviously implied by ATT. It's the finite version of ATT. Therefore, it can't imply B sigma 2. Because remember, ATT is implied by pi 0 and G, and therefore it's conservative over uh, RCA naught. So it's not, it doesn't imply B sigma 2, uh, but it doesn't hold an RCA naught. So it's below B sigma 2. There's not you know, all that much stuff I know, you know below that that's, that's interesting. So that's, I think that's why I actually, I really like this proof. It's not difficult, but I like it because it's a computability theoretic proof where you build you build an instance with no computable solutions, but you do it over a model where you don't have B sigma 2, and that allows you to take infinitely many requirements that you have to satisfy, split them into finitely many blocks, each one of which is finite and bounded, and, and everything works in the end. And I love that as a computability theorist, right? The idea that I can do finitely many things, each one of which is finite, and in the end I've done all of the infinitely many things I need to do. That's, that's how B sigma 2 works. Or failure of B sigma 2 rather works. Anyway, but that's, that's true. So that's the, you have FATT. <coughs> I don't know whether it follows from pi 0 1 GA. It's quite weak, but I don't know. Is it that weak? I don't know. It does follow from pi 0 1 G, obviously, but does it follow from pi 0 1 GA? And one last variation here. Um, we can take the conclusion of the finite ATT and use it as the hypothesis of a theorem. We say, if you have a tree where every sequence uh, of nodes, there's a sequence of isolated paths extending it, then there's a listing of the isolated paths. So that's another version. Of, for some reason in the paper, we called it ATT plus, which is a horrible thing to do because it's weaker than ATT. But, <coughs> so I'm using ATT minus here. So ATT implies ATT minus is <coughs> stronger hypothesis, <coughs> which in turn implies AMT, but again, we don't know whether. So it might be, you might have AMT, ATT minus ATT. They might all be different levels, or they might be all the same. And you know, it is quite fidgety, but therefore it might be interesting from the point of view of construction of first order models. So these are some uh, uh, puzzles that I wanted to mention. And, and let me say something about where these kind of came from a little bit. And it really came about from work on homogeneous models with uh, Karen and Richard. So I don't know if people can read this. this the, uh, the host, the right reverend host says, I'm afraid you've got a bad egg, Mr. Jones. And the curate says, oh, no, my lord, I assure you, parts of it are excellent. Uh, <laughs> it's a classic cartoon from Punch in the 19th century. Of course, the egg is a, is a homogeneous model, right? It's, which doesn't mean that it looks exactly the same. There's, there's uh, yolk and then there's white, right? But the bits that look the same look the same. <laughs> you can't get a partially bad egg. So, OK. So homogeneous model. So here's a couple of classical definitions that you might see one or the other in different textbooks. Uh, what is to say that a structure is homogeneous if, so the, the triple line here means that the two, the two tuples there have the same type. So if A and B are two tuples with the same type, then there's an automorphism of M that takes A to B. So that's one way to define homogeneity. <laughs> two things look the same, they really are the same, right, structurally. <laughs> or you can say that M is homogeneous if whatever A and B our tuples with the same type, and we pick another element C, then there's a D such that D over B looks the same as C over A. So again, it's saying that if A and B look the same, then everything around them is the same, right? I mean, if you can find a bit that looks like this, you find a bit that looks like that, and so forth. These are classically equivalent. If you want the reverse math of it, the implication from two to one is equivalent to AC naught. That shouldn't be surprising if you're building the orphism. So normally, we don't really want to think about Definition one, because in many cases, not all, but in many cases, that would make everything disappear and become at the level of ACA naught. <coughs> now, homogeneous models with the same type, type spectra are isomorphic. Right? So that's one, as I said, we're interested in these kind of models <coughs> that are determined by the type spectra. And homogeneous models have that property. If you say, here's a type spectrum plus it's homogeneous, I'm talking about a single model classically. Now, this statement itself, again, is equivalent to ACA naught. Again, it shouldn't be surprising building these isomorphisms, but classically, it's true. Another important fact, of course, is that every theory does have, every accountable theory has a countable homogeneous model, right? So one might be interested in, in that statement. And this statement turns out to be equivalent to WKL naught. Uh, so McIntyre and Marker's work shows that it can be done in WKL naught. So this is old work. Obviously, they weren't thinking about this, but <coughs> it works that way. And then in this paper with, uh, with Chima Harazanov and Soar, we show that, in fact, it's equivalent. We did a computability theoretically. Then Karen 
uh, did it reverse mathematically for one notion of homogeneity, and David Bellinger did it for other notions of homogeneity, and it's not quite known. There's at least one that's still open, whether it's exactly that, but morally that's, that's right. You know. There may be a B sigma 2 issue with one of the notions. <laughs> but, um, but essentially it's at the level that we can. But that's not actually the theorem that I, that, that, that I want to talk about, the one that we were interested in. Uh, before I talk about the one we were interested in, let me just give an alternate definition just so what I'm going to say is actually true. <coughs> the definition that I want to work with <coughs> looks odd, but again, as you can see, it's one of those first order uh, issues. <coughs> I wanted to find a model to be homogeneous if whenever you have a bunch of pairs <coughs> of um, tuples with the same type and a bunch of tuples extending you know, the C's extend the A's, and there's always going to be D's extending the B's that look the same. So it's exactly the same as definition two, except that now I have a bunch of pairs, and the C's become tuples, and so forth. So this is to get rid of, of a bunch of uh, first order issues, which I'll come back to in a second. But the implication from two to three might not be surprising, it ends up being the I sigma two level. OK. But you don't have to remember that one. You know, just, I just wanted to state that one so that what I say is actually technically true. <coughs> So the thing we were interested in is something that we were calling the homogeneous model theorem. Uh, and the, homo the thing with the homogeneous model existence theorem, the one that just says there exists one, is that, I mean, it's a, it's a very nice theorem, but it's not talking about building a model from a specified set of types. It's just saying build one of the many homogeneous models that this theory might have. Now, do we have something that's more like the atomic model theorem in that it says here's a particular set of types. The atomic model theorem we're just saying the principal types. But here we're saying some collection of types that we specified. Now you build a homogeneous model with that type. So the first thing, if we're going to do that, we need to know classically well, what we, would we need to require of these types. Unfortunately, Gontrov and, and, and also Perdiadkin gave these conditions. Uh, so suppose you have a countable set of types of this theory T. Then there's going to be a countable homogeneous model with the type spectrum S. So type spectrum means these are exactly the types realized in that model. If and only if S satisfies a certain set of closure conditions. So first of all, obviously you want the zero type, the theory to be in there. Okay. You want closure and a variable substitution, right? If you have a type with x0, x1, then the type with y0, y1 should also be there, right? That's, that's silly. Then you want closure and the subtypes, of course, right? The type spectrum of a model should be closed in the subtypes. <laughs> And then the, the two interesting ones. One of them is closure under extension, which is type, type forming amalgamation. So what that means is, if you have a type in S in the variables X, and you have this formula phi in the variables X, Y that's consistent with P, then there is a type Q in S that amalgamates the two of them, that, such that P and Q and phi are both in there. So you can amalgamate types of formulas. And that's obviously, this doesn't even have anything to do with homogeneity, right? If you're going to be the type spectrum of a model, that has to be the case. And then you have a closure under a certain kind of type amalgamation. This is amalgamating two types. And this is the one where homogeneity comes in. So here's the way they stated it. So suppose that you have two types in S. Now they may share variables. If they share variables and you want to amalgamate them, they better agree on the variables. Right? They better say the same things about the shared variables. So if two types that agree on the shared variables, then there's a single type that amalgamates the two of them. Right, where P0 and P1 are both in there. And that's exactly what you need for homogeneity. <laughs> it's not hard to see that if you have a homogeneous model, all of these properties are going to hold the type spectrum, and that's proven RCA not, whatever. The interesting bit is that if the set of types has these closure conditions, then there is a homogeneous model. And that's what I'm calling the homogeneous model theorem. <clears throat> now, again, to make sure that what I'm saying is actually technically true, <clears throat> we actually want to work with a slightly different <clears throat> notion of type of amalgamation, the one that says that if you have finitely many types <coughs> that agree on shared variables and you want one of the types to contain all the shared variables, that's actually necessary. You can play around with it. You can come up with an example where you have three types, P0, P1, P2. They all agree on shared variables and yet you can't amalgamate all of them. Just, you know, you create like a triangle problem, whatever. But if, if a single type contains all of them, then you can. <coughs> then there's a single Q that contains all of them. This is exactly equivalent to the previous notion, classically, right? I mean, you can do, if you can do amalgamate two types, and you can amalgamate any of them. So this is exactly the same. <laughs> but again, for first order reasons, we want to stick that as their official definition. OK, so now we have what we're calling the homogeneous model theorem. Now, one thing that was very interesting about the homogeneous model theorem, and what started this whole work with, with, with Karen and Richard, 
are these suggestive similarities that came out of Karen's dissertation. So Barbara Chima had, as I mentioned in her dissertation, showed that every decidable atomic theory has a low decidable atomic model. Karen Lang, in her dissertation, showed <coughs> that if you have a, a computable set of types closed under the conditions in the previous slide, uh, then it's a type spectrum of a low decidable homogeneous model. So the process of finding the homogeneous model, you can do it in a low way just like you can for atomic models. Then we had this theorem that said for delta two things, <coughs> being able to always do it is the same thing as non-low twoness. Same thing, she had the same result. <coughs> Being able to find a, a homogeneous model with type spectrum S for every computable S closed under conditions is exactly the same as non latinus for delta two. So these were looking very similar. On the other hand, the proofs were quite different. So it was unclear which direction it should go, right? <coughs> but eventually we were actually able to show that these similarities are, <coughs> are there for a very good reason. <coughs> HMT, the homogeneous model theorem and the Italian model theorem are actually the same. Even though the proofs look quite different, they're actually the same. <laughs> they're equivalent over RC non, if you care about these things over wire reconducibility. Of course, the computability theoretic version of wire reconducibility is the one that actually explains the computability theory, right? Because obviously you can be equivalent over RC not and have very different computability theory. But they're very, very tightly the same. There's <coughs> a nice reduction from one uh, in, in both directions. And this was, you know, somehow, I mean, maybe not quite surprising because we had all these results, but somewhat surprising because the proofs looked <laughs> sufficiently different. Is that strong wire reconducibility? I doubt that it's strong because once you get the thing, then you, if you're actually going to produce the model, you have to know the original theory or nothing's going to work. I'm, I'm sure. I haven't checked it, but it's got to be. Now, maybe there's a way of stating it where it would become strong. You know, but certainly, if you're stating it in terms of models and theories, I can't imagine you can get the model without knowing the theory. Uh, so, <coughs> okay, so. We actually get that, uh, that equivalence, which I think was pleasing. It's the kind of thing I, you know, I, I, I like to see in, in reverse math and computer math, things where you kind of explain phenomena right, by just saying, yeah, yeah, these are actually the same thing. Plus, it, it's yet another thing that lives at the level of AMT. Now, if you don't have I, if you have I sigma 2, everything I've said is, you know, there's no variations. But if you have I sigma 2, uh, the equivalence between AMT and HMT is sensitive to the choice of definitions of homogeneity and of closure in a type amalgamation, right? As I said, you can define homogeneity, you can have, you know, you can have like one pair of, of, of things that are, um, that are, that have the same type, or you can have multiple pairs, you can extend by one thing, you can extend by infinitely many things, or sorry, by finitely many things. <laughs> and then amalgamation, you can talk about amalgamation of, of, of a, of two things, you can talk about amalgamation of finitely many, you know, so all of these are choices you can make, and then you get first order issues. So there's all of these principles that connect various versions of homogeneity amalgamation. You know, if you say, if you've got this version of, of amalgamation, then you can get that one, or you can get this version of homogeneity, you know, there's, so as you can imagine, there's a huge chart of possibilities, right? <laughs> and that can have really complex behavior. In some cases, you get which you get something that's equivalent to I sigma 2 or equivalent to B sigma 2 or, of course, proven RCA not. But some of them behave really weird. So David has isolated some versions of that that are equivalent, for example, to WKL not or I sigma 2, which is a weird level, right? And in our paper, we have others that are provable from pi 0, 1 ga and equivalent to I sigma 2 over B sigma 2. So the real reason that we were looking at pi 0, 1 j. I mean, obviously you want to understand the difference between AMT and pi 0, 1 g, but the, our main motivation really was that we had these principles that cropped up when we were looking at these different versions and looking at their equivalences and so on. <coughs> a whole host of them, I'm not going to define any of them just because they're too technical and I don't want to waste time, but you can look at the paper, there's a bunch of them <coughs> that have this property of being provable in I sigma 2 and equivalent to I sigma 2 over B sigma 2. So our thought was there may be an interesting level there where all of these are equivalent, and we want something a little bit cleaner that's at that level, and that's what pi 0 and j is, right? So it's supposed to be a nice, easy to state thing that lives at that level. Unfortunately, we don't know whether it's a single level or a multiple one. <laughs> so we have all these things that are equivalent and live at that same level. They all like join B sigma 2 up to I sigma 2. We don't know whether they're equivalent to each other. We don't know whether they're equivalent to pi 0 and j. I'm hoping there are. I'm hoping that there's a kind of nice little natural level there. But if they're not, this could be really difficult because it could require building a very fidgety uh, first order models. But that's the, the kind of uh, next to last puzzle, or the last first order puzzle that I wanted to mention. <coughs>
So I want to finish with something, you know, and now for something completely different, as they say, but it's not completely different, I mean, because it's about saturated models. You talk about homogeneous models, the two examples that people always cite is atomic models are homogeneous, saturated models are homogeneous, right? So you want to talk, say something about saturated models. So let me say something about, but this is a purely computability theoretic question, but it's still a question and one that I'd really like to have an answer for <coughs> this diagram of the Starbucks saturation in downtown San Francisco area. <coughs> uh, um, so, okay, my last slide here. <coughs> Let's call a degree saturated bounding if every decidable theory, each of those types is computable, has a decidable saturated model. So why am I defining it this way? Well, if you want to build a, a saturated model of a theory, now of course, there's some conditions on the theory, right? <coughs> A saturated, account, a saturated model is going to have to realize all the types of the theory. So if you, if you have more than countably many types, you're not going to get a countable saturated model. But even if you only have countably many types, <coughs> some of the types can be really complicated. And that will make any saturated model have to be really complicated, right? So let's look at the situation where that's not the case, <coughs> where all the types are computable. So the complexity of a saturated model is not going to come because of the complexity of a single type. Now, I could say that the types are uniformly computable, but if I said that, then you'd get a decidable saturated model by known results, so I'm not saying that, right? So this is the next best thing. Okay, so let's call a degree saturated bounding, <laughs> if it's got that property. So Morley uh, and Millar independently uh, show that T is a decidable saturated model, if only if there's a computable listing of, the, of all of the types of T. So that's exactly what I said before. If I can, list, if I can actually list all the types, then I get a decidable saturated model. Now, so we want to know what the saturated bounding uh, degrees look like. And what Morley and Millar's theorem tells us, <coughs> we can forget about building the model, like in the same way that we could forget about building the atomic model. All we need is to build a listing of the types. And then this concept of subnumeration of the computable sets becomes quite salient. So subenumeration of a class C of sets is just a listing of sets that contain C. <coughs> so it might contain things outside of C as well, but it contains everything in C. And Carl Jockers has this really cool result um, that for a degree D, being able to compute a subenumeration of the computable sets is the same as being higher PA. Very cool fact. And now if you actually play around with it a little bit, <coughs> it's not all that difficult to see <coughs> that you can pass from a subenumeration, from being able to subenumerate the computable sets to be able to computably list the types of a model of, of the sort that we're talking about, when we're all the types are computable. And in fact, this was observed by uh, Ken Harris in his dissertation. Uh, and therefore, the consequence is that if, if D is either higher PA, then D is saturated bounding. So in that direction, it works. And now, of course, we want to know the other direction. So Ken in his, in his dissertation was working with C sets. And <coughs> He got up, up to a certain level, and then this work was completed by Antonio Montalban, who showed for C degrees, he has the full result. Every saturated bounding C degree is high. Now, of course, if you're high, you're saturated bounding. For, so for C degrees, that's exact. That's an if and only if. And the question, which I'd really like to know, is can you characterize the saturated bounding degrees? In particular, are they exactly the higher PA degrees? That would be cool. Well, maybe they're not, right? But I think that's a nice uh, computability theoretic question. I don't know you know, how much it's been worked on since, since then, but, you know, I would, like, I would like to see it, and especially I would like, it, if, if it does turn out to be higher PA, which I think would be a cool characterization. And I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Well, of what, I mean, there isn't, oh, you mean of the Morley and Millar theorem? Uh, <coughs> you know, I'm not, sh I'd have to look, I'd have to go back and look and see if we've, we've figured it out, reverse mathematically. It's possible that, uh, like, I know I haven't worked with it myself. It's possible that there's something in, in Kansas City, so I'm not actually sure right now. I'd have to go back and check. What's the reverse math? If you do Morley and Millar of RC not, does it hold it? Do you need like B sigma two? Is there some induction that's going to come up? It is a, but, but it may not, right? So I'm not sure actually. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the answer is and I'm not sure if the answer is known. I'd have to go back and check because I haven't worked with this myself.
Yeah. 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 Yeah, so it might be, I mean, it might also depend on exactly how you define saturated. You know, because again, you have these definitions where you can talk about a single type being realized or a family of types being realized, or you know, so it might be sensitive. Do you know anything, David? About that? No. Yeah. So I mean, my guess is if you pick the right definitions, you can probably do an RSA not. If you pick the wrong definitions, you probably need induction, something like that. But I'm not sure. Yeah. 